It's time for Mid-American Gardener. We are glad that you have joined us and we are here to talk about plants and maybe bugs, trees for sure, and all kinds of things in the indoors and the outdoors for gardening. So thank you for watching. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. And so my areas of expertise are cut flowers and also perennials in the landscape. But there's some very, very intelligent folks next to me who I want to introduce. And so we're going to find out what their expertise is so that you can direct your questions in that way and even send in emails later for another show. All right, so next to me, well, I guess I should not say next to me, but I'm gonna start first to the far side and I'm gonna introduce Bill Erickson. Hi, Bill. Hi there, Diane. Just yeah. give him a little bit of what your expertise is and then I'm gonna have you answer an email. Okay, well. Or a show and tell. I'm a landscape architect with Country Arbors Nursery in Urbana and um, I, I enjoy residential landscaping. I, I like uh, designing small spaces, a backyard, areas, that type of thing, um, and um, I, I enjoy designing uh, uh, landscapes for wildlife, um, water gardening, uh, many different aspects that you'd find in a residential landscape. And uh, I've brought a, a couple of plants here this evening. Excellent. Uh, just to show you uh, uh, some good examples of partial shade perennials. And uh, these are new varieties that have been introduced. The first one is Pulmonaria uh, Majesty, and that's a plant with uh, pink and blue flowers at the same time. It has silvery leaves in the summer, and it does enjoy a partial shade environment. Uh, the other uh, plant that I have is Heuchera uh, Banash, and this is a, a nice purple variety that's been introduced, and it also likes partial shade. Both of these plants uh, need some watering attention uh, during the season and uh, regular watering every week. Uh, they, uh, they need an organic soil. So if you put these plants in a clay soil in a dry condition, they're not gonna do too well. Uh, make sure your soil is properly amended and watering is done uh, regularly. And, uh, but they're, they're great additions to the landscape. We've got a nice contrast here in, in uh, leaf color. Mm -hmm. uh, you can put them next to each other and, and really highlight an area that's in partial shade. Now, Bill, would you repeat what the cultivar name was for the coral bell? And maybe okay. even spell it if uh, it's difficult. The coral bell, which is heuchera, uh, you would ask me to spell here, <laughs> but uh, heuchera <laughs> uh, is H-E-U-C-H-E-R-A, uh, and banache mm -hmm. is uh, B-I-N-O-C-H-E, hmm. and uh, it's a, a new variety of coral bell. The other one is pulmonaria or lungwort. I don't know why they'd ever name a plant lungwort, but they do. <laughs> uh, pulmonaria is P-U-L-M-O-N-A-R-I-A and majesty, M-A-J-E-S-T-E. -E. Both uh, cultivars is kind of tricky spelling. So yeah, right. I've grown majesty, but not banache. So mm -hmm. very good. Those are a nice uh, combination Thank planting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Okay, and now we're going to go next to Dr. Jim Appleby. Hi, Jim. Hi, Diane. Well, I'm an entomologist at the University of Illinois, so I deal with the insects and mites that attack trees, shrubs, and flowers. And uh, Diane, you know, the last couple of months we've been getting questions about moles, voles, yes. and shrews. Yes, we have. So I thought maybe, I actually went out and took some photographs of those animals, and maybe we could show some of those photographs now, these different animals that we sometimes see in the garden. This first photograph is actually a, a, a photograph of, of moles. And uh, folks, notice that photograph at the very top. That shows the front of the animal. And uh, you notice that they have these great big, huge feet. Uh, they claw with that. So they move through the soil very easily with those great big feet. And then the other uh, photograph shows the, the one on the uh, left shows the uh, the top and then uh, you know they're big now this next photograph shows what we call a shrew and these uh, ones on the left that's the shrew and you know they're only about uh, three inches long so people think they're very big and they have a very short tail have very little eyes and they have very pointed nose so uh, you know they're they're quite common uh, and they're uh, they're flesh feeding so they feed on earthworms on insects spiders and that and then the one on the right is actually the common vole, V-O-L-E, and uh, that's also very common, particularly this year they're very common. And uh, that feeds on plants, so it only feeds on plants. 
uh, particularly grasses and uh, it can be a very, very serious pest in young orchards because in the winter time mm -hmm. they actually girdle the, the trees at the uh, at the ground level, so they can be extremely uh, pest, you know, a, quite a pest. And also they feed on bulbs and things like that. But they're actually vegetarians; they're, they're not predaceous at all. And then actually, uh, one of our staff members, uh, Lisa Merrifield, was very nice, and she brought me in a bowl, and I like to show the folks what a bowl looks like. So I'll hold this up here. Now these things are. Um, Actually, I thought they're a little bit larger than what I thought they were. Actually, I didn't really know what a vole was until <laughs> she brought it in, but they're about uh, four and a half inches long, and, uh, and they have a very short tail. You can see the little tail here, not, not, not very long at all, very short, and um, pretty furry. And uh, they're, uh, the underside of them are sort of an orangey color. So that's what a bowl looks like. And uh, of course, they're, like I said, they can be extremely destructive. Then I also brought another, uh, this is actually not so much of a garden pest, but this is a white-footed white mouse. And you can see that the, uh, the mice have very long tails. So the tail is very long and uh, they're, the white-footed mouse is uh, white underneath and then it has this pointed uh, pointed uh, nose and um, great it's big... It's about half the size, Yes, it's say? about half the size and of great big ears. And, uh, you know, they're a real pest in, uh, in, in around if you have machinery. They mm -hmm. make nests. Oh, <laughs> yes. And all kinds of problems. So they love to make nests. And uh, as a result, they can be quite a problem. So now if we get a lot of questions about how to take care of voles, you know, because they are more of a destruction for plants. Yes, definitely. And then we get questions about moles because they make those hideous right, runs. Right, What would you say for both the vole? Well, I think, uh, and I think uh, Lisa Merrifield, uh, she actually used a rat trap and she baited it with uh, peanut butter and she said she put a little bit of uh, oatmeal on the top, oatmeal on the top of that peanut butter and mix it up. And she found that that was very effective. She put the traps out and this is a snap trap, but actually it's a, um, a rat trap that she used. And she put that right in front of the hole uh, uh, at night after it got dark, so you didn't have any birds, she didn't want any birds getting into the right. trap. And then the following morning, in the, in the uh, morning, she snapped the trap. But she got uh, this bowl and several others that way and putting it right in front of the hole. And it worked out very well. So she got c control of the bowls. Now, the, the moles are a different problem. And, uh, you know, they do have traps for moles. I don't think they're exceedingly effective, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really a problem. I don't, I, because they work underground, you know, you, you know what are you going to do? With, how are you going to mm -hmm. control something that's underground? So it's a real problem. There, you know, there are things available at garden centers that ha they need to be specifically marked for moles. Yeah. And I know they've had those worms too. Yeah, they do have those worms, and I, you know, I don't know if they're I'm effective. Not sure Nobody about that. has ever, ever indicated to us. If we have any viewers and they use those worms, they're plastic worms, they're impregnated with the poison, right. and you're supposed to put those worms in the hole. Because you don't the, want anyone else, anything else, to see it. That's you don't right. want birds, that's or, right. as you were saying. Right. So, but anyway, we have been getting quite a few of those questions. So, thank you for taking care of that. Okay, now, have you got spring fever? Well, here's the cure. Attend the Moms Weekend Flower Show on Saturday and Sunday, and that's April 13th and 14th from 9 to 5 on the Saturday, and I think it's 10 to 2.30 or 3 on the Sunday. So this floral extravaganza is held in the Stock Pavilion located at 1402 West Pennsylvania Avenue in Urbana. Stimulate your imagination while viewing the garden displays and indulge your passion for gardening while browsing through the annuals, perennials, vegetables, lots of trees, and more. Also visit WILL's table at the flower show and chat with a member 
of the Mid-American Gardener Show. So think spring, and that's April 13th and 14th at the Stock Pavilion. It's a great time. Well, let's test your knowledge, and we're going to go to a little area, a little thing to do that right now. did not know that. That was the oldest tree. So we're going to learn a few things all the time. Well, let's go to the phone lines and we're going to start first with line two. And it's a question about hydrangeas. Hello there, line two. Hi, I want to move some hydrangeas. They've spread out and I want to move some to a new location. And when I move them, uh, what can you tell me about it? And should I cut off the, the long stems on them or just move them. I don't expect to get flowers this year. Okay. Okay. Well, how large are the plants? Well, I've had them for a long period of time and they, and you know how they spread, the roots spread out, mm -hmm. and I want to take off some of those uh, extended roots. I probably got about four of them I want to take off, and uh, they're old plants. Okay, uh, you'll, you'll really want to get a good chunk of root system when you uh, dig those up. And uh, spring is definitely the time to move them before they leaf out. Uh, so you're going to want to do it, uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, early April uh, would be a, a good time to do that. Uh, they are heavy feeders, so they're going to need some, some fertilizer, um, uh, organic soil, and uh, give them a lot of watering attention the first season. And if... Oh, go ahead. <coughs> What's your second question? Should I cut them back? Oh, definitely cut them back. Uh, um, hydrangeas, to begin with, uh, take pruning very well, so you can you can radically prune them. So I would cut these plants back to almost nothing, and um, just you know just uh, maybe a, an eight or ten inch um, skeletal stub of a plant when you move it, and it'll be fine. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you for your question. All right, now let's go on to line five, and this is a question about platanus. Hi there. Yes, good afternoon. Hi. Uh, I, I was checking the, the older style clematis. Uh, they're the really clematis. dark purple. What is that variety? If, if I was going to shop for that variety in the store. That's Jack Minai. J, uh, just like the man's name, J-A-C-K-M-A-N. I, Jack Manai, might be two eyes on the end. And that's Jack, the old purple one. Okay. But it's Jack a beautiful Manai. one. Jack Manai. Jack Manai. Oh, okay. Very good. Thank Very you. Very good. Thank you. So there's a clematis, and some folks say clematis. I think it's just how you were raised and where you were born. <laughs> right. So anyway, that's a good question. That's a, a tried and true older one, but it's still very nice. All right, let's move on to a blueberry question, line four. Uh, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, I planted some uh, blueberry bushes, uh, I think, three years ago. They're not growing very strong. Uh, I think they got hit by the drought a couple uh, summers ago. Am I kind of wasting my time trying to grow blueberries in this area? I live in Decatur. Oh, I'd say an unequivocal no. You're not wasting your time. You can do it. Uh, how did you amend the soil when you planted those? Oh, uh, did you? Geez, <laughs> uh, I think I just uh, put some uh, oh, composted manure down into the soil, and then I uh, mulched it with bark. Okay. Uh, a blueberry is going to require a very acidic soil, uh, probably 4.5 or 4.8, uh, and to do that, you, you have to heavily amend the soil uh, with uh, peat moss and um, also with uh, sulfur additives uh, in the soil to, to get that pH down uh, to that level. And um, so a lot of peat moss is required. Some people will um, uh, cut a, a, a food safe plastic barrel in half and sink that in the ground and amend the soil within that so that you're not mm -hmm. acidifying the soil all through your garden area. Uh, that's a good way to do it. Uh, but then um, every year you're going to have to add 
a chemical supplement to that to keep that acidity low. Okay, well, they're in uh, uh, an isolated area by themselves. Would that make it uh, better just to amend the, the soil with the sulfur compound? Uh, you could try that. I don't know how successful you're going to be without mm -hmm. that initial soil amending uh, with peat moss, but you could you could try that and, and see what happens. Definitely try it. Okay. Well, thank you for your help. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have heard of a lot of people that have just amended the area, almost make a container within right. <laughs> the ground. But the food safe one, that's a good and idea. And they do so well in this area. They Blueberries do. Blueberries extremely well. Uh, the only thing that the uh, gives them a hard time is the birds, birds love them. I know. So I know a lot of people. Well, do you know, net you them. can get that netting and put over yes. it to mm -hmm. keep the birds out, and you almost have to do that because the birds just love yeah. blueberries. It's or you can stuff. plant a service berry tree, very similar to. <gasps> I <blueberry>. totally <laughs> agree with that. I really like service berry. They flower um, first of June. Mm -hmm. I have to watch for cedar wax wings though, yeah, and they. they love, but yeah. then you know, plant more, plant enough so right. everyone has Everybody it. Everybody has. Some. Okay, well that was really a, a good question about blueberries. Now we have a line three question and it's a very generic one. It's about spring, I believe. What's your question, line three? Yes, uh, it was just a quick observation. Last oh, week I looked at my front flower bed <laughs> and uh, there was nothing. Today I was driving by the front of my yard and the snow had melted and I've got purple and yellow crocus in bloom. Wow. And I then I had to call my brother and tell him. So then later this afternoon he called, and he had a couple of peepers out. Oh, yeah. So spring must be here, or close yeah, to it. I close think so, it. and we're ready, aren't we? Yes, we <laughs> are. And I do have a suggestion about the moles. Okay. My daughter's mother-in-law, she uses double bubble bubble gum. You really? You can just leave it in the wrapper, shove it down the hole, and they'll eat it, and it gums them up, and they go away. Well, boy, thank you for all your comments and helps. That's great. <laughs> Thanks so much. You're welcome. Well, I do know that the moisture, you know, from snow and the sun has been a really good oh, yeah. pick-me-up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> have you heard the double bubble gub? I want to, can't even really say you that. Know, double I have bubble. heard about that. I wonder if they're blowing bubbles under the soil or I don't know. <laughs> Very active moles. So we do, you know, I mean, we can't really, um, from the University of Illinois give that as a recommendation, but you can listen and decide for yourself, yeah. I guess. All right, let's go to line six. We have mole responses like crazy. So line six, what have you got for us? I lived in Michigan for several years. Yes. And Jerry Baker, I had back in about 1990, I got my hands on a, a pamphlet by Jerry Baker that was Baker's a Dozen that I bet every one of you are f familiar with. Oh, uh, yes. Jerry, Jerry had several books, of course, but... He's a unique character. What he had, in which I used up there, uh, was a, a mixture of castor oil, which is very expensive, and hot pepper sauce with some lemon detergent and some warm water. And because of the expense with the castor oil, I quit using it and got back in more with the hot pepper. And it worked, but you have to herd them. You can't just spray the whole area or they'll just go nuts. So you have to herd them away from where you want them. I had zoysia grass around my swimming pool and with a snow cover, those rascals would go in there and, and just make a mess. But it worked with the uh, hot sauce. It worked with the castor oil also. That coats their fur. But I had good luck with the uh, hot sauce and the detergent and warm water. But remembering that you have to herd them, you just can't broadcast the stuff. Okay. And they will come back. Yes. They're just going to go to your neighbors and they'll come back to you. So you have to be ready yeah. and prepared to do the same thing over and over and over. I had all the traps. I killed some. I killed more of them by drowning them in my swimming pool at night. And you weren't even trying to do that. So. No. <laughs> well, but, thank uh, you. I There's feel, <laughs> lots of good more. ideas here. But ca I have heard castor oil was expensive. I know some mm -hmm. people who actually plant the castor bean plant, but you can't plant that many. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. okay. Well, I think you've opened up a, a can I, of moles. I knew I would. <laughs> but that's okay, because we all have the issue with it. Well, now, <coughs> let's go to line two before we get some more uh, responses about moles. And we're going to go to uh, a grapevine question. Line two. 
Hi, thanks very much. I have moved into a house that has a, about a 60-year-old grapevine. It's huge. It has not been pruned or cared for in a very long time, and I don't know how far back to prune it, and I know I better do it quick. It is not budding yet. Well, I believe the folks at our orchards prune in February, mm -hmm. so yes, you had better do it pretty quick. And I know you can get some of them pruned to the outside, you know, a couple strong leaders going horizontally. You may want to find some, uh, look for some good extension publications that show you how to do it, but they prune them back very hard. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you have any other insights about yeah, it. But no, I, I totally agree. But that you try I to. Know, I, I've got the extension information, but it talks about young grapevines, and it, this literally uh, is about 20 feet long. It's a huge old vine. Is it growing horizontally yes, it, at all? Yes, oh, it's horizontally probably 20 feet. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Well, you need to do some trimming back. Go to the very end part of what they say the young branch should, you know, the young vine should do. But you prune it back. I mean, it's, it's to bigger canes. So you may want to get another, um, I know I've got several books you know, for vegetable and fruit growing, and they show older ones and how, you know, how you want mm -hmm. it to look aesthetically, I guess. But okay. it's a lot. Um, they pruned just a few vines. I said, yes, I'd like some grapevines, and they filled my entire workroom from just a few vines. Yeah, That's how much yeah. they took off of it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, right. um, it's a major pruning, <laughs> yeah. and you can use those if you have any yeah. decorative things. All right, now we're going to uh, take one more mole response, and let's see about line four, please. My line four? Yes. What oh. is your What is your uh, advice? Yeah. Am I line four? Yes, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> I have used um, <laughs> moss balls. I've just taken a moss ball and tucked it down in the hole, and... Uh, they seem to just go away from that, and uh, really my best thing is my dog. She hears them and digs them up, but of course she doesn't necessarily dig where I want her to, but she's a very good mole catcher. Could I ask a question about my mysterium? Mysterium? Yes, you may. Um, should I cut that back? This is, I had it for two years. It didn't bloom. It hasn't bloomed yet. It's growing like crazy. Uh, what should I do about it? So it's just a two-year-old wisteria. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bill, do you want to well, chime in? It's going to take a long time to flower usually. So uh, some of them don't bloom for, for 10 years or so. So I would just uh, let it grow and uh, have patience. That's a good answer. Okay, thank you. And we will be right back after this. we have another show and tell and so I'm gonna kind of throw it over to you Jim what have you got for us well you know we often talk about biological control and uh, an agent that really is a great biological control in the garden are birds and uh, particularly the house wren so I would encourage everyone if you got a yard and you have some trees and shrubs in your yard to purchase a wren house and you got to be careful about the size of the hole my uncle always would say you use the hole about the size of a quarter, mm -hmm. not much mm -hmm. bigger. It can actually be just a slightly larger than that, but not lar much larger than that. And you know, you can put those under the eaves of the house. They're not particular, and they eat a tremendous number of insects. And so I would get the house up sometime probably in, in uh, about uh, mid-April. They generally start showing up in the latter part of April. But wrens are just great little birds. And, and does that work for all of the wrens? Are they all insect eaters? Yes, all the wrens okay. are insect eaters, yes. 
uh, probably my favorite little wren. I had a Carolina wren. Oh yeah, tremendous. And we have other types too, but oh, the yeah. Carolina wren oh, they're my um, favorite too. decided to make a nest on top of all of my little, my horticulture books in my garden shed. Yeah. <laughs> and so I couldn't use those six or seven books because <laughs> for that season, because they have several. Yeah, oh, they have several you know, broods. Broods, and so that. Um, after a while, I was able to use them. Oh, yeah, that they're, one. they're really my favorite, too. Carolina. Well, that is a very so, good biological control. It's I'm glad you brought excellent. that one up. Well, we want to thank everyone who's given us um, some advice and also, you know, good questions as well. And I think it's nice to be thinking about biological control and right. things that we can do and plants that, you know, invite pollinators, yeah, too. Right, so right, yeah. uh, the garden yeah. is uh, a yeah. whole entity, it not is. just not just an individual Whoa, ecosystem. Con consider some purple martins as well, yes. purple martin house. Yeah. That is true, and you know, frogs and all kinds of things. So, so we want to thank you for your response. We want to thank you also for watching. We hope that you get out there and garden, whether it's indoors or out or just for fun. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.